told you before. This is one of the most important shows we're doing to our millions of listeners. Because we know through our many surveys that this is the number one show when it comes to voter registration and voters. The people that listen to this show go to the polls. A lot of federal funding comes from uh, collecting child support. But one of the things that's happened in the last 10 years, and I used to be a child support magistrate, so that was what I did for, for many years. What's happened le lately is that the federal government has, has realized that parents who don't visit their children often don't pay, or, you know, so there's a, there's a connection there. So I'm grateful for my job. It is a blessing. I'm elected to the seat. This is my fifth election. I have given my blood, sweat, and tears to doing everything I can every day of my life on that bench to, to provide a decision that is thoughtful, compassionate, and fair. So fighting, the fighting with the parents is bad. Bad for the kids, literally for their growth of their brain. And I understand the distinction between church and state. But when I take that bench, I never take it alone. Because I'm up there and so is my dad with me. And I pray for guidance when I get on that bench every single time. The cases that we have are very important. If you ask anybody, what's the most important case you can handle? The answer is going to be their case. So we have criminal cases up to capital murder, civil cases that can be workers' comp or medical malpractice or a car accident. We are a trial level. We do it all. And I just strive through the efforts that I have done with my pro bono work, expungement work, leadership roles in the community, serving on boards, working with the developmentally disabled, the mentally ill, the addicted, the homeless, working on the consent decree on the mental health piece. Every single thing I've done is to be the kind of judge I think every one of us wants, someone who is fair, someone who's colorblind, someone who is loving and respectful, but can distinguish that person that has to go to prison. But you know, in this country, right now, we've got 2.3 million people incarcerated, okay? We release the population equivalent of Baltimore back into our streets every year from penitentiaries. In Ohio right now, we have 51,000 people incarcerated right now, record-breaking. So what we need to do is alternatives to this. This is just this incarceration that's been going on and on and on uh, has got to change. How we think about punishment has got to change. I've heard about reform, but I've been singing the same tune for as long as you've known me, Art. Yes, we have. Yes, so uh, that's where I've come from. I've always tried to help the little guy, but I want to be uh, a judge who is known to be thoughtful, intelligent, fair, compassionate, reasoned, prepared. Get up there, know what you're doing. Study your cases. Pay attention to lawyers. Give litigants their day in court. Give a process that is constitutional and fair. Look out for all persons, no matter who they are no matter who they are, the marginalized, the disenfranchised, in every case. Pay attention to what victims have to say. Pay attention to what the, the people that nobody listens to have to say. That's, that's what I try to bring to the bench. So you say that every day you're on the bench, uh, your dad is on the bench with you? My God is on the bench with Your me. God. Yes. Oh, but I guess we could call him Daddy, right? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, right. no doubt about that's it. That's okay. Yeah, your, so we're your, saying the same thing. Yeah, your God is on the bench with you. That's right. My goodness. My goodness. I understand the separation between church and state. I don't want to get anybody mad at me, okay? I understand that. No, that, that I'm just saying I'm, I am a person of faith. Yes, uh, no doubt about it. That's let, right. Let, let, listen, I, I have a question for you. Sure. In these trying times of addiction. Yes. Trying times of addiction. Right. This might be, this might be the, uh, and, and I've seen a lot of uh, trying times as far as drug addiction is concerned. Uh, at one time, I was addicted myself. So I'm speaking from a personal level as, as well. But to see that Cahoe County Court of Common Pleas Recovery Court Program, the Honorable Judge Joan Sinnenberg, tell me about that. We are Supreme Court certified, which means that this specialized docket, treatment-oriented docket, has met the rigors that you have to go through to establish yourself as being uh, 
proficient in the area of treatment and responding to people who come before the court because of addiction. Sometimes you can avoid the felony conviction if you participate. Not every case is diversionary. What we do is we accept people with felonies of the third, fourth, or fifth degree. You can have up to three priors. Typically our cases are low level felonies, as, I, as I'm saying, uh, nonviolent offenses. But we're dealing with people who are addicted and right now we see everything is on the rise. Of course, heroin, fentanyl, cocaine, overdose deaths are all on the rise right now. So we've really got to work carefully with our clients with treatment that deals with their trauma and their mental illness and the addiction. So for instance, if you have someone who's involved in the sex trade and is an addict, mm -hmm. you gotta deal with both issues at once. And I'm pleased that we have a treatment team with medical and mental health professionals. We meet as a team each week, discuss the cases, and come up with a, a clinical assessment from our clinicians uh, that focus on that person. Because we realize that if you come into our court with mental illness and addiction, you probably have got trouble with your kids, you probably have trouble paying your bills. That's right. You might be getting thrown out of your house. Been there. That, okay. So what th this pro bono stuff I'm talking about, pro bono work means that you get a lawyer for free. But in, in a criminal case, everybody gets a free lawyer. It's those civil cases where you don't get a free lawyer. If you're going to get thrown out of your house, the last thing you can do is pay for a lawyer, but you need one. If you can't pay your bills, you need a lawyer. If your kids are being taken away from you because you're addicted, you need a lawyer. So now, built into this program, we have pro bono, free civil lawyers for the ladies and gentlemen in recovery court and also in drug court. So we provide that. It's a holistic approach. This specialized docket takes a look at a person and says, you are important. I want to help you restore your life. You and your family get back together. Get back on track. That's the whole goal of this. And we have the support of our highest uh, court in the state of Ohio. We're very grateful for that. And we have a success rate too. And you see less recidivism with people who successfully complete the drug court and the recovery court. We followed the drug court model like Judge Larry Jones started back in 1996 in Cleveland Meany Court. Uh, that tradition followed. Judge Matai has it in Cuyahoga County Common Police Court. This is after the, that type of model, except that we also treat the person who's got the mental health issues going on. And that's not uncommon. Well, well, I'd like to make a testimony that this a uh, holistic approach helped save me and okay. helped me to be here to talk to you right now. This, so, you that's, uh, so this holistic uh, uh, approach is very important and, and so it is an honor because I know you're going to treat it right. It's Thank an you. honor for you to be a, a, in the he head of this recovery court program. Thank you. Thank uh, you. And the community support means so much. We're taking care of over 100 people on our docket right now. And you know, to know that, to hear your words and to know that others support their efforts, for us to destigmatize addiction. You know, somebody isn't ashamed if they have diabetes. So we cannot, we have got to treat people with addiction as equal as everybody, as to, the same as anybody else in our community. It's a disease, let's be there. So the fact that you're supportive, and we see a lot of support with uh, so many people in our community. We have a lot of partners here. And to see that is so important for the people who are struggling to, to get through this. And you're, you're, you are a living testament to this. Here you are hosting your radio show, you are a community leader, you're a community activist, and you can tell your own story. And it's a powerful one because it does, it does inspire others to, to pursue positive change. They can do it. And that's a message that we need to instill. And you know, there's nothing wrong with a judge saying to somebody who comes in front of them that they care about what happens to them. And I think that how we think about the role of a judge in our community also perhaps is uh, going under a bit of a transformation. Joan, I take my dad, uh, Judge. I'm going to call you Judge. Oh, it's fine. No, no, it's no. Fine. Judge. Fine. No, I know that. I know that. But, but uh, uh, it's important that I call you what you are, the Honorable Judge Joan Stenenberg, yes. because when people go to the poll, and listen, it, it has been uh, documented that uh, the University of Common Sense radio show have the most registered voters, and the people you're talking to are people that's going to the poll and vote. Yes. Uh, 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 so, so, uh, so what I'm saying is that uh, because of that, I want to make it clear that when people, because judges are always the last 
I don't know why. Right. I think they should be at down. the top. Yeah, but yeah. they're always at the bottom. Uh, I just want to make sure that that when when they 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 they're hearing your conversation, and I want them to uh, to be able to discern uh, and know that you are uh, Judge Joan. Pronounce your name. Sinnenberg. Sinnenberg. I'm the only Joan on the ballot. So yeah, yeah. If you're looking right, you have to go all the way down. You know, judges make big decisions in your lives. They That's can take I'm away your about. money. They can take away your property. They can take away your life. You know, go down that ballot. Look at that race because judges, what they can do in the types of cases that could bring you in, any one of us in front of them are very important decisions. So we need good judges. Check me out. I'm on Facebook. Check out my record. I, I'm a known quantity. Story you don't have to wonder what I'm going to do. My name is, oh, to answer your question, Joan Sinnenberg, S-Y-N-E-N-B-E-R-G, Judge Joan Sinnenberg, Judge Joan Sinnenberg. Judge, Judge if we could stay with this, uh... Uh, I'll stay with the recovery court program sure. for a minute. Sure. I'm, I'm going to get a little sensitive with you. Okay. All right. Now, when I was, uh, uh, when I went through uh, the program and was uh, honored enough to get through the program, which saved my life, I know I did notice that there were more um, Caucasians okay. or, or others that had the opportunity to go through the recovery program more so than blacks at that time. Has that changed or, or, or was I seeing things? Was I seeing color blindness? Well, I will tell you, I will take anybody into my program. Right now, what's happening with this, this overdose death oh crisis yes. in our community is that most of the people who are dying are white. Uh, for for instance, within the last few months when it was 50 deaths that particular month, right now we're over 300 overdose deaths, uh, and it's only August. In but the state see, or the city? Oh, oh. just in Cuyahoga Cuyahoga. County, right. <coughs> but we see that uh, the vast majority are white, there's black, and there are others. But uh, to get into any kind of recovery program in my court, I, I don't care what you look like, but, you know, there was disparity in how... Uh, cocaine versus crack cocaine penalties went down for many, many years. And I think that really was reflective of, of a problem of demographics because crack cocaine was a more urban drug and it was punished more harshly than powder cocaine, which was a more suburban drug. So now that has all leveled out and those offenses are punished equally, which I think is progress. But when it comes to treatment, I believe in treatment. You are living proof that treatment works. So if someone comes in my courtroom, treatment is as available to anybody. I don't care who you are. Same with recovery court. It just seems that right now, because four out of five people who are addicted are addicted uh, in recovery court are opiate addicts, heroin addicts, fentanyl, and it's much of it is starting from prescription medication. If the, not to go too far afield here from your question, uh, but the the programs that are available are available to anybody. Right now, the crisis that we see with overdose fatalities, are it's killing a lot of white people. Not to take anything away from uh, the importance of non-fatal overdoses, too, by the way. A a absolutely, Judge. And, and uh, by the way, I, I take my dad with me everywhere I go. That's why I'm, mm -hmm. I'm God, just, uh, uh, just like you do. That's why uh, I've been able to kick it so long. I'm so uh, proud. That's wonderful to hear you talk about this openly and to inspire others. That's so unselfish and giving of you. And, and, and Judge, let me make uh, this perfectly clear. Uh, having went through an addiction myself, a bad addiction, I don't want anybody, black, white, blue, or green, if they're addicted, they need help, right. I want them to get the help. Uh, uh, let's make that clear, okay? Yes. But, but uh, and, and then I'm gonna get off this subject. But I, I have noticed, and you've been on the bench quite a while. Yes. Isn't isn't it isn't it? Uh, I don't want to use the word strange. Isn't it different that all of a sudden uh, white are have took the leading role in in this um, in this uh, heroin uh, 
epidemic? Well, I think what's taking the leading role in this epidemic is heroin. Heroin. It's, it is a killer. And as it turns out, most of the people who are addicts are white people. But we're seeing, go back 10 years, people weren't dying like this. Sure this is This is killing more people than car accidents, homicide, suicide. This is different. This is the leading cause of death in the state, okay? So we have this crisis. And I, I got to say, I, I recognize that for what it is, but... And I'm sensitive to what you are saying. As a person, as Joan Sinnenberg, I will tell you that if somebody came in front of me that's African-American with a drug problem and was not a heroin addict but addicted to something else, I'm going to do everything I possibly can as a judge to get them into treatment. That's a commitment that I can make to you. That's a commitment that I've lived. That's why I say experience does matter because you can check out my record of doing just that. And I've, I've dedicated my life working in the county jail as a social worker you know, that's when I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a criminal defense attorney when I grew up, and I was, and then just got the blessing of getting you on the bench. You worked the county jail as a social worker? Yes, I did. Oh, wow, that's, that's a great way to, <laughs> to, to, to learn the lessons yes, of life. Yes, and that's when I really was inspired, because, you know, you see, you know, there but for the grace of God go any one of us. And I would sit there dealing with clients day after day in the pod thinking, you know what? Something went wrong someplace. This doesn't have to be this way. I want to help. I want to help people. And and I didn't wait to become a judge to help people. When I was a lawyer, I was volunteering with Charles C. Community Reentry, Women's yeah, Reentry. I mean, I've been. To, yeah. This is what I've been doing for yeah. 28 years. I'm not new to this. No, you're not. So I let, listen. This is the uh, most interactive radio uh, talk show host there is. We have phone calls too. Who's on the phone line? Talk to me. Talk to Joan, please. Judge Joan. Shift gears a little bit. Uh, I did say that I think that prisons are definitely a spot for some people and that our country should really revisit how we think about punishing nonviolent offenders. Mm -hmm. But I'll, And I'm not talking about this case to our caller. I'm talking about just let's, getting back on time. Listen, to, Paul, I'm, I'm going to let you hang up. Listen to it on the air, okay, please? And you have a nice Thanks. evening. So just to get back to... Uh, to judges that believe in second chances, and again, I'm not speaking about the case that this caller called about, but when I give somebody a second chance and put them on supervision and they abuse that over and over and over and over and they get treatment and don't go, uh, or they fail, to, uh, they fail to submit to drug screens and they come back and forth in and out of the criminal justice system on violation hearings on probation, there comes a point in time where we can't work with you. And some people are in jail because they get a, pr a probation option and simply abuse it. So I will give this message out to, in speaking about second chances, it means that everybody's got to be engaged. And with recovery, when someone gets engaged in recovery, they've got to be an equal partner. So if someone comes into our recovery court and says, I want help, then we know they can take, that, that they can be someone who is successful. But so many of our successful drug court graduates, for instance, will say, if you don't want it, you're not going to get it. So we've got to have people that really do want positive change. And, and I appreciate you mentioning recovery court today, Art, because what we see are people that have taken odds that seem insurmountable and really, really been able to get around those demons and defeat this this horrific crisis that we see happening. Sure. Common plea judge for seven years? Well, actually, uh, this is my ninth year in common pleas. I've, it's my twelfth year on the bench, so it's my tenth year in common pleas. Uh -huh. uh, there's a couple years in Cleveland Muni also. Right. So, uh, and, and we talked about the mental health docket, which is right. very, very important. Yes, that's to help people who are suffering from uh, mental health disorders uh, and also people who are developmentally disabled. That docket's uh, very helpful to people in our community that otherwise might not receive that type of assistance. All right. And, and municipal court judge, uh, Judge Jean Merrill Capers was a municipal court judge, yes, right? Yes, she was. And by the way, we've heard a lot about the judge today, but nobody mentioned what kind of tennis player she was. She was, she was an amazing tennis player. That's part of her legend, too. Let, let, listen, you know what? When I go to the VA hospital, funny you mention that. When I go to the VA hospital and, I, and I'm up there in the physical therapy part, I look out the window, and that's who's 
name I see on that tennis court. Oh, All right, to everybody who's in Art McCoy's University of Common Sense, the millions and millions of listeners out there, thank you for listening to me. I am your judge. I'm Judge Joan Sinnenberg. I love you. I care about you. And if you want a judge who's going to listen with compassion from their heart, give their soul and their mind, you want Judge Joan Sinnenberg. I am a graduate of the Art McCoy University of Common Sense, and I ask for your support on November November 8th, Judge Joan Sinnenberg. Let's all hear it for Judge Joan Sinnenberg. Woo! Woo! Hey, Judge Joan Sinnenberg. Okay, okay. All right. Judge Joan Sinnenberg. Judge Joan Sinnenberg. We're talking about judges today. Bring me that other judge right now. A judge. We're not going to waste any time. I want you to hit me hard and hit our millions of listeners and voters on what they need to know about you. Sure, thank you, Art. Thank you very much for having me tonight. Uh, first of all, I, am, uh, I was appointed by Governor Ted Strickland in 09 as a judge. After 23 years as a magistrate in the court, I was a law clerk there and then a magistrate. Now I've been a judge, this is my eighth year. Um, I've devoted my life only to family law. This is the only judgeship I would ever want. Um, I have an awful lot of sophisticated uh, knowledge about this particular area, which is a very broad area. It's important that you understand childhood development, that you understand uh, mental health, that you understand a lot of things about children and family dynamics, as well as the financial things, which you know, many of our, our people that come through own businesses and we have to divide those businesses or figure out a way to cash out the person who's leaving the marriage if the marriage owns a business. So we have an awful breadth of information. In the last several years, we've had this financial crisis. So we've had to dig deep into foreclosure law, bankruptcy law. A lot of our people come in there. They've lost their house. We have to figure out not how to divide assets, but in fact, how to divide debt. And it's, it's been, that's been a sort of a sad thing. And of course, we all know that children in divorces, if there's a lot of conflict, get damaged. So the main thing I guess everybody should know about me is that's really where I put my focus. Um, I've studied that and I've talked a lot to a lot of people who have knowledge about that area. And in my cases, I've put the children first. And we try to get the parents to mediate and to work out a settlement that's good for the kids. And I think every child deserves a parenting plan. That's, that's more than just um, a sentence in a, in a judgment entry or a divorce that says, you know, mom gets weeks and dad gets weekends. A plan should be um, where the child's going to school, what the religious upbringing is going to be, uh, who's going to be involved in that, how do you, who takes the child to the doctor, who makes those decisions. There's a lot, a lot of things that are really important that um, people, the kids get lost in the shuffle. And this, so I've devoted all of my cases, I, I make it a point that the children have a plan about them. It's not just a, uh, a separation agreement that divides the stereo and the CDs. Um, that, you know, people spend pages on, on their property division and they don't spend enough time thinking through about their children. So A, I want them to do that and B, I want to help them do it in a way that's less damaging because we know it's not just violence. Well, I think we all know violence damages kids. Just simple conflict damages kids. So, so, Judge, I, I, I love that uh, uh, your approach. I love your approach. You're saying that that all this material stuff and 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 you can fight about all kind of stuff, but when it comes to you, you put those children first. Absolutely. And 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 I don't care nothing about no cars, no house or that. Put the children first, and everything else will work out. Uh, uh, and and I love that approach. So that that's really the most important thing. And since um, I've been a judge in the court, we have initiated a mandatory mediation program for parenting. So when a case comes in, if the parents don't already have a plan, we send them to mediation in, t in, s in the court. And it's a small charge that comes on at the end of their case. And it's going to be the best money they ever spend because the, our, the mediators will sit down with them and do it, exactly what I'm saying. They're going to do a plan. They're going to ask those hard questions. Not just Tuesday, Thursday, not just 5 or 6 o'clock. You have to think about the family, too, um, in terms of what is the work schedule of the parents and what's the lifestyle and are there um, community around, who's the extended family, grandparents, aunts, uncles, uh, where do the children go to school, where do they attend, their, you know, have the religious training, who takes them, how, do, how is that going to happen? So you ask those questions and you get a picture of how you can um, 
have a plan that fits the children's needs as well as the parents' ability to get them places on time because that's that's a terrible problem if somebody agrees to do something and then the children don't get taken to football practice or wherever they need to go. So, so, uh, so Judge, what I want you to do right now is I want you to look right into that microphone. Listen, as I told you, uh, you're talking to an audience that vote. And of course the judge is at the bottom of the docket uh, uh, as far as, as, as the ballot. Ballot, yes. So I want, you to, I want you to come strong with my listening audience and tell them about your record, tell them about you, tell them what you want them to know about you. All right, well, um, the most important thing I, I would tell anybody who is interested in is uh, an educated voter to go to um, two places. Judge for yourself, and I don't know if the results have been posted yet or not, but I received four excellence from the four bar associations, including the Norman S. Minor, the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association, the Ohio Women's Law Association, and the uh, Cleveland Defense Attorneys. So I received four excellence, a score of four out of four from those four bar associations. There's another place you can look. It's called Judicial Votes Count, started by the Supreme Court of Ohio through the University of Akron. You can post your info. Everybody all over the whole state who's running for judge can post information, and I would ask people to look at that and read that because it tells a lot. So what do I do right now? I've been really active with the Supreme Court of Ohio my entire career when I was a magistrate uh, as well as now doing training. The I don't know if people, everybody knows this, but judges are trained by judges. They have special education. We they call it uh, CJE, Continuing Judicial Education. We're all required to have a lot more hours than just lawyers have. And several of those hours are required to come from the judicial college. So I've been involved with that um, close to 30 years. And what we do is we plan education and we train the judges and, and the magistrates. So I've been involved in new judge training for new domestic relations judges. Even when I was a magistrate, I, I was part of that. And um, it was sort of awkward. The year I got appointed, I, I taught and then I sat down in the class because I was part of the first session, <laughs> the first day. Yeah. Um, but that's uh, I'm the chair of the board of uh, the Judicial College Board of Trustees this year. I'm the president of the Ohio Association of Domestic Relations Judges. So I'm really involved in things that uh, I think na statewide that are important to keep our judges level uh, high, to keep them educated, to keep our training because law changes, things happen. You want to be up on the latest things. Like I said, like neuroscience is huge now. We want to know about how things impact children um, when they're, you know, in, in conflict or how, um, you know, medicine affects children with ADD. We get a lot of children who have issues, autism, ADD, some other kinds of problems and the parents are fighting about whether they should be medicated or not, um, you know, what kind of school they should go to. So we need to know all of that. And with my 30 plus years, I have that information, I have that knowledge, and I've been committed to you know, maintaining that. And I, I believe very strongly that a judge in this court, this is a specialty court, it's domestic relations. This is the court where normal people go. It's, this isn't criminal, this is civil case, this is a case. Here's what I think about it. It's people who are in a marital crisis, unfortunately have to go to a court of law to get a legal divorce. But those people getting that divorce, um, that's just civil case, but what's happening isn't a lot about the law. It's about restructuring their family, getting along, trying to make things happen in a positive way so that they can um, remake their families and, and continue to parent their children in the future. So those are all really important things, and I, I'm committed to all of that, and I've been involved in a lot of uh, like, you know, supporting legislation that's pro-children and um, you know, making sure that the judges in this state are educated. Those are all hugely important things. They don't know uh, which way to go, uh, so I'm glad that you're, you're, you're very uh, educated on that uh, because when they come before you, I'm sure that you'll give them the... It's important for children, for, for the, not just the, you know, the parents and the children to be able to know that they're, they can talk about these issues and this, everything becomes a battleground. What's something pretty normal in a family when they're getting along becomes uh, a terrible thing and, and, you know, a point where they're, um, actually they're pointing fingers at each other during the divorce. And so those are the kinds of things like the child's medication. One parent doesn't give it, one parent does give it, one parent overdoes it. These are the allegations that are made in our cases and so we try to sort through them. We try to get them help and we try to get the best advice. I'm 
I'm not saying I'm a pediatrician. What I'm saying is if I have a case with that, um, I try to know where to send the people or who to talk to or what, what kind, you know, how to at least frame the questions so we can get the best information. In domestic relations court, um, I was a law clerk. I also, I had 21 years as a professor at Cleveland Marshall College of Law. I taught at night. I taught family law. I taught legal writing. I taught bar strategies and tactics. Um, advanced legal writing, several different courses, and I coach I coach kids who uh, study for the bar. I've so, done that so, so, over the years. So this has always been your interest? It always has. Since I don't know exactly when I shifted, I thought I wanted to, I've always wanted to do public service. I never wanted to do anything but that. And at some point I thought I wanted to do something more with the federal government, but when I was in law school, I didn't like those courses and I love family law. And um, I, in the law clinic, I did, I did divorce cases and uh, I've been doing this ever since. So and I've done a few other things like my first year, but once you're a magistrate, you can't practice law, so, but you can teach. So I taught and I was a magistrate for many, many years. And to me, it's, uh, it's a calling. It's really important that you have people in the specialty courts that, are, that have a heart for this job and understand the, you know, exactly the details. And this is not a job for novices. It's not, somebody, it's not a job for somebody who just wants to have a, a, a J name in front of them. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. a, it's about people who really care about families and, and want to move the law forward. And I've worked toward that. And uh, I've, I'm on a committee for the Supreme Court, or I'm sorry, for the Judicial Conference, which is a group of statewide, all the judges, called the Practice and Procedure Committee. And what, one of the things we do is when the state legislature is looking to uh, adopt a new law, they ask for our opinion. And then we look at it and say, this will help or this will hurt. You don't, you know, there's, an, uh, there's always unintended consequences. Somebody thinks they need a law that's going to help them for their specific thing, but it hurts 20 other people. That's not a good law. You want the law to be as general as possible to help as many people as possible, not to single out and make laws just for somebody who has the ear of uh, someone important. Hey, he's beautiful. <laughs> hey, he take care of business. Hey, you got two minutes to give me your closing argument. All right, thank you. Um, I am the only qualified candidate running for this spot. I have 30 years of experience. I have uh, Judge for Yourself has given me four excellence. And uh, it's the only thing I'm going to say about when, I, I don't know if they've been published yet, they're supposed to be out by the end of this month, but the person running against me received four not recommended. That's a zero. Zero out of four, I had four out of four. That, that should be all you need to hear. But more than that, I, I really, I believe in my court. I believe that we have to be compassionate. I believe that um, these kids are the most important thing. And I have committed to that, and I will continue to commit to that for the next six years. So I would really ask everyone out there, I know it's hard, P-A-L-O-S, it's not like eloquent. My grandfather wanted to be an American. He threw away the middle. It was Paniyotopoulos. <laughs> so P-A-L-O-S. But I am the last person on the ballot who's opposed. So there's two or three judgeships in juvenile court after me, but I'm the last because of where my term starts in domestic relations court. I am the literal bottom of the ballot for opposed people. So just go to the end and start there and go backwards. Vote go, for, go vote to, for me. Yeah, go to the bottom. It's very important. That's why I want to have these judges on because it's very important. They're, they're at the uh, bottom of the ballot, but they're some of the most important people uh, that you ever want to meet uh, when it comes to your life. President, we can vote for Congress, representatives, but let me tell you something. I don't know nobody that impacts my life, or the sheriff's life, or H.J. life, or Ted Gary life, more than judges. That's why we had them on. I hope you got the information you need to go to the bottom of the ballot and vote.